Sollen wir starten? Okay, genau. ja, wir starten. Okay, dann, uh, no, we switch. So, now, uh, Stefanie Köller and I would like to present to you the companion, a companion for an easy internet. This is a book that is coming up in the next month, we hope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's about accessible internet and easy to read, of course. When people talk about um, accessible internet, there are two aspects that always come up. On the one hand, the web content accessibility guidelines, in short, VCAG, and the topic of regulations and standards. Both have direct impact in general, uh, in public administrations and persons working in these places, of course, as well, in companies working with public administrations. People working at these places sometimes have difficulties implementing and meeting the requirements set by the laws, the directives, and the guidelines, especially when it comes to easy to read. This was the idea behind the companion, the behind the book, and the, the aim is to help people implement easy, accessible internet. Today, um, Stephanie Köhler, or Stephanie? Yeah, Stephanie. <laughs> Stephanie is going to present the legal context, and then we will give you some examples from the book, how we've approached the analysis and the results. So, Stephanie, the yeah. floor is yours. So, first of all, uh, I would like to give you the rare idea of our research um, which work which we planned together and fulfilled finally. Um, and, and I want to mention uh, with Ms. Janina Spang, um, because she validated uh, a lot of criteria uh, which we found in easy to read and as, um, yeah, which, which align technical criteria. So, um, first of all, we, we thought, how um, can we reinvent the wheel? How can we, uh, is there really um, uh, a, a possibility to compare the um, web content accessibility guidelines with easy to read rules. And um, we, we wanted uh, to know um, by this, is there any regulation given by the EU over directives or something like that, which make our research interest um, yeah, useful for society? Is there any regulation which um, makes the participatory society possible? And therefore, therefore, first of all, we thought, yes, of course, we have the web accessibility content guidelines. Where do they come from? And what are they for? And we have the easy to read guideline, guidelines and is there to find a common sense. And yes, as you see on the slide, we uh, found out or we detected four regulations in the legal context which uh, make this topic really stunning. First of all, uh, the EU Directive um, of 2016 uh, which um, yeah, suggests all public bodies to uh, give the communication in easy to read. So, um, and that on websites, uh, and um, it's a kind of rare information. You know the All About Us site, the navigation, and further informations with, which might be of interest. Um, and we thought, okay, that's a start. That's a start um, in legal communication. And second, we found the EU Directive 2010, which regulates 
um, yeah, all, uh, or offers audiovisual media regulations, uh, which are of interest because of the interoperability every mankind needs. If you, I want to have access, I need a criteria for interoperability. So, um, that a user can use a website, um, let it call me efficient, effective, and satisfying. And therefore, we have this EU directive. Then we found the e-government action plan. And this is really important uh, to follow the citizen rights because each mankind has uh, yeah, the right to fulfill them. And this is legal communication. This means all the uh, data storage, uh, then all e-procedurement, and to fill in forms. Forms like, um, yeah, doc tax form, that I'm able, as a citizen, to say, okay, I have a dog at my home and I want to pay the money for it. And therefore, the access to this is of importance. And there are much more forms to f fill in. And last but not least, um, we found the European Accessibility Act, which is quite famous for the moment and in big discussion, because it will regulate the whole market of private devices uh, given in hard and software. And um, so the private market is interesting what for, we thought. Yeah, by sure. For example, medication leaves. If you want to get your information, how to take uh, your pills you need every day, then it's good to have an understandable access to a medication leave. Perhaps by a QR code, yeah? Okay, so we thought, yes, this research is okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we did it because we founded the basement, the legal context. Because without that, it's not very useful. And then we, we, sh we looked, okay, now which standards uh, do we find uh, as normative standards? Oscar mentioned some of them uh, this morning already. And uh, we reached out beside the easy to read standard, as you know all of you, um, for software. And for this stuff you need if you want to have a proper website or proper portal on a website uh, to get access on. So you found, first of all, the standard uh, in the EU for websites and mobile applications, electronic documents, and software. And the second one we detected and explored was that with ergonomic and interoperable preconditions, as I mentioned before, it refers to the EU Directive 2010. And then the ISO uh, for accessible components of user interface. This is what we call usability, and its definition is, as I mentioned before, effectiveness, um, efficiency, and satisfying uh, yeah, access. And uh, then the fourth is information technology. It's a quite new one, and it refers to the web cognitive guidelines. The web cognitive guidelines are, um, let me say, the, the newest of them, which are included in the web content accessibility guidelines, and they face our target group of people with uh, cognitive learning and psychological disabilities. So, um, the cognitive guidelines uh, additionally include the user insight. And this is also totally, is, uh, to, uh, totally new too, the user-centered perspective. And this is what we do in Train to Validate as well 
And what we did in our research work, the user-centered perspective by validation. Then it's okay when it's validated. Then it is efficient, effective, and satisfying. So this did Janina. Okay. And we thought, okay, we have now um, the legal context, we found standards, normative standards, and uh, we thought about what, 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 how does it belong and refer to um, easy to read. It's very complex, and by that we wanted to scale it, to see it properly. And this is the innovation. Um, of this research that we scaled easy language for the first time and um, it's useful for all people using um, yeah the uh, who want who want to translate and who want to create a proper website but it's additionally useful for validators if they want to understand as Janina mentioned in the interview, we have not just text, we have much more. So we scaled in non-textual criteria, referring to the first normative standard I presented to you, the textual criteria, referring to easy to read, information for all, and interoperable, criterion to the other standard. So, and we took then a deep insight first to the web content accessibility guidelines. And we thought, okay, what are they for? Is it you to present or me? It's, yeah, okay, we, I can do it. So we have a perceivable four principles. Perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. And as you might know, we have nine user accessibility needs in, um, yeah, in, in, the, the, in, in the side towards accessibility. This is a classification of uh, disabilities in human mankind they can have, they can challenge by, challenged by. And the four principles try to, yeah, to, to give them a home for access. So the perceivable, uh, perceivable principles are um, mainly for people which are deaf, blind, or have uh, issues with their view, they cannot properly see. The operable principles are mainly for people with movement disorders. The understandable ones are the web cognitive guidelines. So can I understand clearly and uh, yeah, can I navigate through the website and so on. And um, they are, and the robust ones are very cool ones which are not really related to easy to speak, uh, easy to read, but um, we need them because they mean that anyone can you get information without a loss, um, independent from the user interface you prefer. So, nevertheless, if it, it's a voice over IT or JAWS or yeah, some other kinds um, of things like that or Braille, yeah? So it's uh, really useful and it shows you our perspective. It's not the perspective we took just for people of our target group um, which are challenged by one uh, disability. We took the pers perspective uh, towards people we mostly find they have a disease or a disability accompanied by a comorbidity or another disability. So let me call it the holistic view. We not just scaled, we also had the holistic view. 
So, and what did we do with this knowledge? We try to figure out a kind of minimum requirements of maximum accessibility caused by this complex uh, research work. So, um, what does it mean? How is the definition for minimum requirements for maximum accessibility? First of all, access for all people. So we, we, we need a minimum standard for all nine user accessibility needs. Then it must be interoperable to prove that it's, um, let me say, accessible, that I can use it independent from my user interface I choose. And third, it must be usable um, and that by the user-centered perspective. And this all gains together a minimum requirement for maximum accessibility. And then we, we, we said, okay, let's scale, create and approve. And we found an assortment of criteria in several standards. A, double A and triple A criteria out of the web content accessibility guidelines. Mostly the triple A criteria are to be found in the web cognitives. And then textual criteria like the easy to read guidelines and interoperable criteria for the usability to prove the usability. And then something very cool happened we found out matches. Matches between technical criteria and textual criteria. And we thought, wow, it's an improvement for the research work because it shows we have to see it as a whole. It was quite right to say, yes, we, we put the things together, we think about uh, the web content guidelines in behalf of easy to read. And uh, yeah, this makes me goosebumps, you know. <laughs> it's, it's really interesting to find out 33 correlations of 65 criteria. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's oh. a lot. So, here, our method methods we had where to, f first of all, we explored 78. You are right, I mentioned 66. Yeah, how, how did this uh, happen? We had validators and the validator said, yes, this criteria is useful and this one is not. And we had not just Janina, we had, um, as you know, here in Munich is a, a yeah, big uh, center for people um, with learning disabilities, which have accompanying disabilities or comorbidities, uh, the Finnish Parade. And uh, we had uh, the luck to get, um, by Alois Wieshuber, who is not today with us, uh, 10 validators um, which could approve and which could select the criteria and which fulfilled our target that we want to do it, um, including the uh, uh, nine accessibility, uh, user accessibility needs. So, and uh, therefore they said, okay, uh, 66 of them are super. Then we identified the relevance, so, and validated the selected criteria, and then we saw the cross-references between easy to read, and uh, yeah, we implemented. And now, um, Rocio will give us a deep insight um, how this looked alike in practice. Yeah. Yes, yes so, um, as Stephanie said before, you have technical criteria, and we found out that many of these 
technical criteria, they have a textual component. And this is exactly the, the place where easy to read and the guidelines can meet. For us, this means that we can rely on easy to read criteria in order to get these textual bits, I would say, of the um, criteria out to create them. So we've seen before, we have four principles and they all work together to make access something accessible. So perceivable, if I can, for example, if I cannot see, if, if I can see it, but I cannot use it, operable, they, then it's for nothing. If I can see it and I can use it, but I don't understand it, understandable, it's for nothing. And again, if I can see it, if I can use it, I can understand it, but the web page cannot communicate with the device I need for the interaction, then it's for nothing again. So all these principles, they are relevant and they talk about accessibility. They just take another stand. They just approach it from a different perspective. Okay, so perceivable. Perceivable is the first principle. The message sent out here is, thus, um, is to help users by decoding the information. Decoding is our ability to use knowledge in letters and sounds to make words or non-words, for instance, a number. So we know that decoding, we know from research and from didactics, that decoding is the first step in reading. This uh, principle has four guidelines and 29 criteria. The idea behind the, the guidelines are that we have to offer, in a web page, we have to offer at least two channels. So if I'm sending out information through a visual channel, I have to provide an alternative that can be, for instance, read, be read out loud with a screen reader to a blind person. This would be an audio channel. Then we have adaptable. Once the channels are open, I would say the information in your website has to adapt to the device and the way the user is presenting the information without any losses. We'll see an example just, um, just now. And then distinguishable. Distinguishable is about reducing workload, make it easier for the user to decode. Let's see some examples. Ah, I forgot that. <laughs> Here is an example of alternatives. On the left-hand side, I'm sending and conveying a message through a visual channel. So, according to the WCAG, I have to have an alternative channel, which is on the right. I have a text, and I've used an HTML tag, the alt tag, to write the information I'm conveying in the image on the left. So here, I have two different channels. This means a person who is blind and is using a screen reader, the screen reader reads aloud the alt text, a Dalmatian protein, and the person gets the same information as on the left. So this is the standard. In our analysis, we, th we saw this is a technical um, criteria, but it has a textual component. And this is where easy to read guidelines can help us. So how do I create an easy alt text? Well, I just take the recommendations from easy to read within the limitations of an alt text and create it. For instance, this is, um, uh, in this case, I want my participants to know that Adam Altician is a dog, but because I think not everybody knows that, and it was very relevant for that presentation, and it was relevant to know that Adam Altician is white and has black spots. So this, this is why I put these two information pieces in my alt text. Again, within the, um, within the restrictions of an alt text, an alt text, it, does, it has to be descriptive has to be concise. Shouldn't be longer than 120 to 125 characters. You shouldn't have any line breaks. You should use punctuation. Why? Because the screen reader pauses. If I write a full stop, the screen reader will pause and continue reading. 
This is important when conveying information as well. And then I will have another presentation, I hope, in my life, where I say, I like the, pic the picture, but I'm not conveying any information. In those cases, how do I solve this? Well, I just leave the content of the alt text empty, as I've done here. Then we said ad adaptable. Um, again, once the information is coming through the channels, the information has to adapt to the device I'm using. If I'm using a small phone or I'm using a big computer, in this orientation, that orientation, there can be any information lost on the way. And most importantly, also the relationship between the information pieces. A heading has to be clearly a heading in my small phone as in the computer, if there is a picture related to that heading and to that text, this should come across. That is adaptable. And then distinguishable, this is all about reducing overload. I think for us, creating easy distinguishable, I'm just going to jump, is quite easy. <laughs> because we have so many recommendations from easy to read. And then you see, you know, make it good contrast, use bigger fonts, separate the lines. You know, this is all something that we know from our daily easy lives. And of course, if an element in the web page is active, like here, the send button, then make it visible, make it clear, give it the focus and make the focus clear. Okay, so the result of the analysis out of 29 criteria, 23, were uh, considered by experts and validators as relevant for uh, easy to read users. Five are technical and out of 18, we found 17 which have a, te a textual component and we can find help in the easy to read guidelines that we already have. Okay, I'm gonna see. Ooh. <laughs> the, the next principle is operable. This is, very, this is all about you know, making possible to use the website, right? And how? Do it in different ways, in the way the user wants to do it, and at the pace the user wants to, to have. Five guidelines, 29 criteria as well. The basic ideas be behind operable are, first of all, uh, everything has to be accessible and usable by the keyboard. I mean, I really have to say this. I mean, we buy computers and you get a mouse, you get a keyboard, you get a screen, and then you go to the internet and you can only use the mouse. And I say, why did I get the other things as well? You know, and this is all about this. There are people who can only access content through the keyboard, so please make everything accessible through keyboard. Enough time, give the users time. And if you cannot, sometimes for safety reasons, you have to have a timeout, then you should warn the user and tell them how to stop the timeout or what happens after the timeout. My bank does that. I'm only allowed to be inactive for 15 minutes, and after that, they kick me out, right? That's OK. It's a safety feature but then tell me what to do and what's going to happen. It's what Janina was saying before. You know, just let, me, let, let it be predictable. I want to know what's going to happen. No context changes. Being in the internet also means being health, healthy, not causing any harm to people. And this is all about this flashing and blinking stuff that may cause seizures. Navigable, we've said before, let the people know where they are, how to find things, and how to use things than, um, is in an easy way. Input modalities is very related to the one we had before. They should choose how to enter information. This principle is very technical, so the results are not surprisingly. We have 23 criteria out of 29. They are relevant, 17 are technical, and only seven have a textual component. And for six of them, we have a reference in, or a help in easy to read guidelines. Then we have understandable. I think understandable is the principle that is closer to all of us, because it's all about writing. 
And like I said before, we have a, a beautiful web page that we can use, and then I just don't get it. I just don't understand what they want from me. So do not let it be in vain. Make it easy to understand for the user. It's a pity, you know, if it is nice to look at, but it does, it's, not, it's not useful. Okay, here we have three guidelines and 17 criteria, if I'm not mistaken. This is, of course, about readability, predictability, and input assistance, readable. In internet, in the internet, we have humans reading the content and we have machines reading the content. That means that it has to be clear to a screen reader, can I read this information in Spanish, in German, in Italian, in what language? So this is one side of it. And the other side of it is the readability that we know from the normal test. And here we find recommendations that are known to all of us in all languages. Write clear, use short sentences, explain words, explain abbreviations. If there is a word with two different meanings, then explain both meanings to avoid misunderstandings, and so on, and so on, and so on. Predictable, no changes. Let me know what's going to happen. But also, be coherent. This is all about terminology as well. Use the same words in the web page for the same, for the same purpose. We, I think that's um, something we're used to from the translation. And then input assistance, help, 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 provide help while entering information and once a person has made a mistake, just help them to get out of there. Let's see some examples. Of course, here, a lot of tech, oh, textual components. This is an easy form for entering information. In Germany, I'm not, uh, how late am I? I'm very late. <coughs> 10 minutes, ah, okay. Uh, thank you. This is, uh, I don't like this time out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so textual components and help from easy to read. In Germany, when you find a barrier in a public administration web page, you can report it. That's right, no? Yeah. Yes. And for that, you have a form, and this is the form. So as you see, many things that we can apply. We have the labels, clear labels, uh, big font size. We have um, our, um, a natural or a conventional order. So the person is uh, the, the reading order, or the reading order is easy to follow. Is the conventional one, and I like this one that I have highlighted. In that part of the form, the person has to describe the barrier. Of course, the author, which is Stephanie, <laughs> could have said just barrier, but then instead she decided to tell to explicitly tell the user this, the instruction, write here, describe, please describe here the barrier. Just one sentence, explicit information, useful, I think, for all of us. Very easy to implement. But it happens, people make mistakes, we all do. So how is an easy way of helping somebody out of that situation? Here again, a nice solution. We have on the top, first, a list of things that should be, or not should be, have to be corrected in this case. And after that, down at the very, uh, at the very space where they have to correct it, they are told what they have to do. In this case, the add uh, symbol or whatever special character is missing, so they are told, please enter um, an email with that character. Here again, the user is being told, you're missing the content here. We need a description of this barrier. So I've told you this is an easy form, but would have, isn't it for everybody? If you see it, it's just well done, well prepared, and well thought for everybody. OK, so the results of understandable 13 criteria are relevant, and from those um, Oops. Ah, no. 
for our technical, I think I didn't, ah, no, I know. 13 out of 17, I get it now. Uh, 13 out of 17 are, are relevant, four of them are technical, and 13 had a textual component, which is, you know, under understandable, it was, it was uh, predictable. Okay, the last principle is robust. Robust is about technology talking to each other. So as we do talk to each other in the same language, so that technology needs to do so. Of course, this is a very technical principle. We, it's, a, it's a short one. We have one guideline and three, and three criteria, actually. The results are they, they are all important, of course. We need that our assistive technology, all of our devices communicate to, with regular computers and iPhones and so on. None of them has a textual component, although I would say, for instance, for status messages, when something happens in the, and they have to send out a message, this has a textual component and can follow the easy-to-read guidelines, so that's why we made that note. Okay, so we're coming to the end. Yeah, and, and, and we will we'll do it together. We will do it together. We'll do it together. Yeah. And maybe I just want to point out the first one. Uh, one of the, the ideas was to create minimum, describe minimum requirements <coughs> for maximum accessibility. By maximum accessibility, we wanted to, what well, we meant taking into consideration easy to read, and persons with uh, reading difficulties. And one of the outcomes is that um, simplification goes be beyond text simplification. And I think we've seen the four principles, and the experts and the validators say they all these perspectives help in doing things easier to understand. Yeah, and the second was that it is useful to scale the topic, mm -hmm. to, to um, see the non-textual, the textual, and the interactive components as a whole, as we see people in a holistic way, which are challenged. And um, therefore, we um, were glad um, by the approval that we found those matches uh, was you presented to us all. Um, and these matches highlighted that um, research hypothesis that it's, it's really useful to see it in a complex way. Um, and the approval of the validators was useful uh, to, to give our research work a deep impact of the user-centered perspective um, on which legal contexts also in um, the e-government regulations take a stress upon it too. So, in the end, um, we could figure out that there's an asset for translators and for software engineers too, to work together by perhaps this new standard of minimum requirements to improve, to accelerate, easy to read in web applications. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ja, ja, natürlich. Ich, du kriegst sogar ein, ein, ein Mikro. Ich darf das nicht machen, warte. Ich muss es erstmal ausmachen. Danke. Ähm, und zwar habt ihr gesagt, es ist wichtig, dass ich eine Internetseite auf verschiedenen Geräten äh, gut lesen kann. Ne? Auf dem äh, Laptop, auf dem Tablet, auf dem Handy. Ähm, es gibt eine Richtlinie der leichten Sprache, die sagt, äh, jeder Satz sollte in einer neuen Zeile stehen. Das ähm, habt ihr ja auch äh, gezeigt. Ähm, 
ich sehe hier die Herausforderung, wie stelle ich das so auf dem Handy dar, dass das auch nutzerfreundlich lesbar ist. Also ich habe sehr viele Internetseiten in leichter Sprache gesehen, die sehr schwer lesbar sind, weil ähm, der Umbruch irgendwo erfolgt. Auf der einen Seite dort, ähm, wo es der Übersetzende vorgesehen hat, damit Sinneinheiten zusammenbleibt, also weil die Regel sagt, ein Satz, eine Zeile, wenn es nicht passt, dann sollten Sinneinheiten zusammenbleiben. Auf dem Handy habe ich dann den Umbruch irgendwo und dann nochmal da, wo halt kein Platz mehr ist. Am Ende habe ich ein Wort nur vielleicht alleine, dann, also es ist sehr, sehr ähm, unstrukturiert, unharmonisch schwer zu lesen. Ja, habt ja. ihr eine Lösung für dieses Problem? Ja, also wir im, in der Theorie, die Techniker in der Praxis und das nennt sich Skalierbarkeit. Also jede, jede ähm, Webanwendung muss so skaliert werden durch die Programmierung, dass eben der Inhalt wiederkehrend gleich ausgegeben wird und das auch im Format. Und äh, jemand, der das beherrscht, ähm, der sorgt dafür, dass das eben, was du eben sagtest, Inga, nicht passiert. Aber zu selten wird darauf geachtet und deswegen war es uns auch wichtig, weil manchmal ist es so, dass äh, dadurch einfach der Zugang verloren geht. Dann habe ich eine Webseite in leichter Sprache, ich bin Nutzende, ich schaue mir das an und dann ist alles verschoben und manchmal überlagern sich auch die Bilder und dieses Programmierkriterium haben wir auch aufgenommen ähm, und das wurde auch geprüft und als wichtig empfunden von den äh, Prüfexperten oder Validators, dass äh, es keine Überlappungen gibt. Also du siehst diese Überlappungen oft bei Schrift, du siehst die aber auch tatsächlich bei Bildern und Schrift und dann kannst du einfach den Inhalt nicht mehr wahrnehmen. Zumal ja besonders viele NutzerInnen mit Lernschwierigkeiten übers, Inter äh, übers Handy äh, das Internet genau. nutzen, wenn. Ja, ähm, ja also theoretisch ist das schön, dass ich weiß, ähm, ein Programmierer kann äh, in jedem Gerät und sollte genau anpassen, wo welcher Satz umbricht. Pragmatisch ist es ja leider so, in der Praxis wird es auf dich gemacht und wird auch gesagt, also da haben wir jetzt auch gar nicht die Möglichkeiten äh, für, wir haben ein Content-Management-System, da können wir nur die Texte einfügen, wir haben leider keinen Programmierer in-house, auch keine Mittel mehr, ähm, das nun nochmal äh, zu beauftragen, die Internetseite ist ja nun, wie sie ist. Was mache ich dann? Sage ich dann, okay, ideal wäre das, Alternative, wenn das nicht möglich ist, dann ähm, sage ich, ich mache doch keinen Umbruch nach dem Satz, sondern äh, dann lieber einen Fließtext, damit er auf dem äh, Handy auch lesbar ist. Also ne, wir haben eine Anforderung und was machen wir, wenn die Realität, wie es nun leider oft so ist, nicht perfekt ist? Also ich bin kein Techniker, aber ich glaube, das Problem können wir tatsächlich nicht lösen, weil es muss responsive sein, das heißt, du musst es eben auch klein sehen können, ohne Verluste, ja, das schaffen sie. Aber wenn ich dann dazu dermaßen zunge, dann habe ich eventuell nur ein Wort pro Satz. Und das kann man nicht hot, hart kodieren. Ich kann, oder? ich kann nicht sagen, die, die Zeile beim Sum 250 ist nur zehn Charakteren, dann würden sogar nur zwei Wörter, also ein Wort ist normalerweise fünf Zeichen, ich glaube, das Problem können wir nicht, nicht lösen. Das ist dann, wo die Technik, Harald sagt ja, kann Harald, sag du was dazu. No? Okay, okay. ich dachte, du wolltest noch was dazu Frage. sagen. So. Ja. Zuerst. Okay, ja, also, ähm, ah, ihr wollt was sagen, ja bitte, Paul. Ich wollte, ich wollte, Inga, ich wollte noch was dazu sagen. Das ist natürlich so, dass oft äh, diese Antwort kommt. Und dann steht man da und denkt sich, okay. Äh, und da würde ich immer den Rat geben, weil diese Barrierefreiheitskriterien gibt es ja schon sehr, sehr lange. Und es gibt eigentlich gar keinen Grund mehr heute, ähm, zu sagen, ja, unser Content management system ist jetzt so und das ähm, ist dann eben... 
Öffentliche Stellen sind dazu verpflichtet, die Barrierefreiheit ihrer Webseiten äh, zu deklarieren. Und dann würde ich immer empfehlen zu sagen, okay, wenn es für euch so nicht passt, dann schreibt bitte auch in die Erklärung eurer Barrierefreiheit rein, die Seite ist nicht skalierbar. Das ist dann ein klarer Mangel. Bitte? Das ist, das ist richtig, aber es gibt viel rechtlich, viel mehr öffentliche Stellen, als man denkt. Eine öffentliche Stelle ist nicht nur eine Behörde, sondern die Jura sind das alle, die zu mehr als 50 Prozent vom Staat kofinanziert werden. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, um, I know, uh, we, if we don't have the mics, we, we cannot uh, do the interpretation of the questions. The question was... Um, that there are many, it's not only the public administration, but there are many other companies, associations, whatever, who are not really compliant, and then this information is not implemented correctly. Paul? Es gibt noch Fragen? Ja, ja. Paul wollte was sagen. Ja. Danke, ja, eigentlich eine Anmerkung. Also, wir sprechen davon responsive design. Das ist der richtige Ausdruck. Und responsive design kreiert ja dieses Problem der Textumbrüche. Jetzt heißt es immer, das Problem sei unmöglich zu lösen. Es ist aber so, dass wir in den leicht verständlichen Textdaten ja Sollumbrüche entsprechend der Verständlichkeit haben. Wenn wir sehr viele Sollumbrüche analysieren in Texten, dann können wir mit einer gewissen Wahrscheinlichkeit einem responsive CMS-System vorgeben, wann soll der Text umgebrochen werden, wenn dein Fenster sehr klein gemacht wird. Also ein Unterschied zwischen einem großen Button Screen, den du am Desktop benutzt, oder deinem Mobiltelefon. Und so Dinge sind technisch schon umsetzbar. Man braucht halt nur eine gewisse Datenmenge und immer eine aktuelle Datenmenge, weil bei neuen Themen wird das natürlich wieder anders sein. Und wir haben damit mal gespielt und das geht ganz gut. Wir haben da einen Näherungswert, das funktioniert ganz, ganz gut. Wir haben auch keinen Service daraus gebaut, aber grundsätzlich ist das Problem lösbar. Und ja, ist eigentlich auch gar nicht so die wahnsinnige Hexerei. Man muss es nur mal fertig machen. Also praktisch, ich bin Übersetzerin, ich mache meinen Text und ich merke, ich markiere zum Beispiel gelb Sollbruchstelle, damit dann die Programmierung in HTML dort das einbaut, dass es in der äh, in Mobile, also in der, ja, ich glaube. <lacht> ich bin die Brücke. Okay. Uh, nee, nee, wir machen ja einen SaaS-Service, der in deinem CMS eingebaut wird und die Texte einfach verarbeitet. Und wenn das Fenster zu schmal ist, das heißt, wenn, du, wenn, du, wenn er weiß, du hast nicht einen breit genug im Textbereich, dann bricht er um entsprechende Erfahrung der Verständlichkeit. Das kann scheitern, das scheitert dann wahrscheinlich auch in 30 Prozent aller Fälle, aber in 70 Prozent aller Fälle kann es funktionieren. Und damit automatisch, ja, weil das schaffst du ja nie. Du hast ja, du hast ja stufenlose Fensterbreiten. Und du kannst dementsprechend nie, oder die Arbeit wirst du dir nie antun können, dass du alle Sollumbrüche selber händisch machst. Du musst dich dem nähern, statistisch nähern. Und das ist grundsätzlich möglich. Ja? So. Ja. Uh, vielleicht ähm, Paul Mayer ja, wird uns später über künstliche Intelligenz, man hört da schon raus, dass er hier ein Experte ist. Und ähm, ich glaube ein bisschen, ich bin ganz bei dir, bei euch und das Problem ist, glaube ich, was, ähm, was du sagst, Inga, es ist vielleicht umsetzbar möglich, aber wie viele Leute in wie vielen Stellen können diese Umsetzung machen und ich glaube, die Erfahrung, so wie ich dich verstehe, ist, dass viele das nicht umsetzen können und tatsächlich bleibt es responsive, so klassisch responsive, dass man es größer machen kann, aber das Thema Umbrüche wird nicht gelöst. Aber das ist echt ein schönes Thema um ein Buch zu schreiben, <lacht> ein Projekt zu machen, weil der Bedarf ist groß, diese technische, wir haben heute die textuelle Seite, aber die programmatische Seite, wie machen wir das programmatisch, so dass sowas nicht passiert, die ist, glaube ich, noch sehr in den Anfängen, aber dann erzählst du uns später noch mehr. Noch eine kurze Frage? Ja, vielleicht auch nur kurz, 
in Englisch bitte. Und eine Anmerkung dazu. Das eine ist die quasi AI oder künstliche Intelligenz basierte Umsetzung auf der Ebene der Technologie. Das andere ist die intellektuelle auf der Ebene, was müsste der Kunde brauchen. Was aber noch ein ganz großes Problem ist, ist die Umsetzung dieses Change-Prozesses. Und an dem hapert es an den meisten Stellen. Das heißt, das müssen wir einfach berücksichtigen. Erst einmal aus dem, aus dem Geschäftsmodell eines Unternehmens oder auch einer Organisation aus den Aufsehen schaffen es die meisten nicht, so etwas schnell umzusetzen, weil es braucht Medienkompetenz und es braucht die Umänderung eines bestimmten eingebauten ähm, Ablaufs. Und an dem würde ich sagen, ist, der, ist die größte Hürde, ja, weshalb wir, glaube ich, immer sehen müssen, wie kriegen wir so eine 80-20-Regel hin und was ist sinnvoll. Dankeschön. Also das würde ich ganz gerne auch noch mal unterstreichen und das zeigt aber auch, wie weit wir zurücklegen, weil die ETH Zürich dazu schon vor, ich glaube, zehn Jahren eine Nature oder Science Publikation gemacht hat und gesagt hat, es ist ganz bedeutsam, dass Unternehmen heute, also vor zehn Jahren, so etwas ausbilden wie eine Knowledge Society. Dieser Artikel ist auffindbar und es ist erschreckend, aber es ist genauso wie mit den Menschenrechten, die in der UN-Behindertenrechtskonvention äh, getroffen wurden und vereinbart wurden und auch eben mit, den Barriere, mit der Umsetzung der digitalen Barrierefreiheit. Es geht eben sehr langsam, aber es ist wichtig, dass wir beharrlich bleiben. Ja. Eine kurze letzte Frage. Ja. Yes, okay. I hope uh, there is not uh, anything left uh, out of the translation when I was listening. But uh, do you consider uh, three aspects of the of the wording of the of the sentences? One is text wrapping, meaning that one sentence that uh, that is usually in the same line uh, can have a different uh, visualization than uh, a new line and also a different visualization than the paragraph. So meaning that uh, in the design itself, uh, there can be three, uh, three different options of, uh, of somehow uh, letting the user know uh, where, where uh, the information should be uh, uh, meant to be meant uh, together or not. So basically then a free aspect, do you consider all three of them? Well, I think, I think we have to consider, I think this is Inga's point, because each of them, as you describe, have a different um, purpose. And this is part of the message you're sending. So if I have to leave, this is why we say leave space between uh, paragraphs, because one idea is in one paragraph and then you have another paragraph with another content, and the same thing with the lines, you know, it's like that it's probably more decoding, helping to decode, than separating ideas. And so, but the problems remain the same. If if a responsive does not cannot take all these things into consideration, then this information is lost. We're all about um, adaptable. What we're talking here is when I receive the information, if I have a, a simple way of of seeing the information, um, it doesn't. It, I have to receive it without any losses, and what we're saying just now, this is our losses of information. So, technically, I don't know, maybe Paul can say more about that, but I, I see it very similar, the problem is very similar. You just have more cases. Do you take those into consideration as well? Is it possible, Paul? Uh, well, statistically, I don't think it's easy, but if you use machine learning, when we integrate more and more parameters, 